Good morning, and welcome to the debut of Maritime Matters, a show that will discuss history, culture, and industry today and tomorrow linked to the South Coast. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you're going to love this program. Let's welcome together a host, Eric DeWicke, president of Northeast Maritime Institute. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Phil. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm excited about this new opportunity. This is uh, very exciting. Uh, Tell us what inspired the idea and what this is going to be about. Well, the whole idea started out when uh, we started the new degree program at Northeast Maritime Institute. We really realized that the community at large did not know about, A, Northeast Maritime Institute and what it did and what it stood for, But most importantly, how we had really um, tied our maritime industry towards the fishing industry alone. And that's how we looked at New Bedford. When in fact, New Bedford has been one of the largest merchant marine ports in the world at one time in history. Um, We actually train merchant mariners from all over the world, from Brazil, Nigeria, Europe, uh, the Baltic states. Uh, They all come to Fairhaven here the school. And we realized, boy, we have not done a good job of connecting our community with the maritime industry as a whole. But most importantly, we have not done a good job of letting our community know about employment opportunities, about jobs, about economic development. We are really riding on a potential wave that can can re-engage our community in the maritime industry as a whole. The concept of this radio show is quite unique. I've never heard of any other radio show that has this model to it. Well, I'll tell you, the South Coast, Fairhaven, New Bedford is is the maritime world. You know, the reality is we we developed the history. You know, people like Warren Delano, who was one of the greatest traders in the history of the world, FDR's great-grandfather, you know, really established this port as something very, very unique. And, of course, the whaling industry making uh, the South Coast one of the most richest communities of the world during that period. The textiles industry, all those textiles shipping out on vessels, being distributed around the world. We really need to talk about that and how we can reestablish ourselves as, as an important piece of maritime industry, maritime jobs, maritime culture, and how we distribute ourselves back out into the global economy. Can you explain why you chose the title Maritime Matters? Well, it's a little bit of a, a double entendre there. Sure. It's uh, interesting. The, though. the the reality is, our maritime sector does matter to everything we do. When we wake up in the morning, what do we first do? We we hit the shower. We use soap that was imported. We use shampoo that was imported. We go brush our teeth. Our toothbrushes were imported. All of, all of the things we do, including our clothes, including often the automobiles that we drive, everything was imported and brought to us on a ship. Maritime industry does matter. However, locally, we have maritime issues. We have maritime matters that we really need to focus on in, o- in, in order to enable us to move ourselves as a region into the global economy. And I think the best fit for New Bedford is not to reinvent ourselves, but simply look at who we are historically, who we are culturally, and re-engage in that industry. Now, you uh, say that the uh, program is going to touch upon the history, the culture, and industry, how it pertains to today and tomorrow linked to the South Coast. Let's take a look at that, Eric. Uh, The history itself, you touched upon some of it, already. I'll tell you, the history is magnificent. If any of you have not, as, li- as the listenership, have not been to the Whaling Museum, take time. Bring your children, bring yourselves. Take a quiet afternoon and go to the Whaling Museum and connect with your history. What you'll see is not only the whaling industry, but you will see something about the textiles industry, the glass manufacturing industries, the um, scrimshaw industry the arts, the culture, you will really get a great introduction to who we are as a maritime community in the past. The, when you look around Fairhaven, you look at uh, the relationship of, I mentioned earlier, um, 
Warren Delano. What was the significance of Warren Delano? He was one of the greatest China traders in the history of the world, uh, established in a remarkable relationship with China, um, and really opened up the doors to global trade for the United States. Mm -hmm. When England was really taking the position, uh, Delano somehow slipped through the back door and, and really established the United States as a key player. Um, you look at the relationship uh, or the story of the uh, John Manjuro story. Um, that's one of the most brilliant historical and most brilliantly significant stories that the maritime sector has brought to international relationships. Um, when, when you think that a whaling vessel from Fairhaven picked up uh, this lost fisherman uh, and his friends, um, brought him back to the United States, he received an education, he received enough money to get back home to Japan where he was immediately arrested, by the way, um, thrown in jail, and then when Admiral Perry's fleet showed up on the shores of Japan, they went to John Manjiro to uh, open up the dialogue because he spoke English. And, and that relationship truly uh, developed the U.S.-Japanese relationship, both positively and, of course, we had some negative events that happened. But uh, it's so, such an exciting thing. We were lucky enough to host the uh, U.N.'s uh, Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization, who was a, a Japanese national uh, he came to Fairhaven, he, he, he engaged in the Manjaro Trail, uh, he stayed at our house here in Fairhaven, and, and wow, I'll tell you, he goes around the world talking about relationship building between nations based on maritime events, significant maritime events. And it's really been fun to, to watch that facilitate in the international theater um, when we just think of it as, as a local story. Folks, the voice you're listening to is probably familiar. You hear Eric DeWicke many times on commercials, aired right here on the new 1420. However, this is the very first time that you're hearing the debut of this great new radio show. It's a concept that I'm sure is going to be interesting and exciting. It's called Maritime Matters with your host, Eric DeWicke, who will be discussing uh, various uh, issues of interest from culture, history, as you just touched upon, uh, how the South Coast is interrelated here, and so many other very, very good topics. Of course, Eric is the president of the Northeast Maritime Institute, and as the president, I know that the Institute itself, although many people pass it and sometimes... They know the buildings, they know the area, but they may not know what goes on there. Hopefully this program will help explain some of the purpose of what you do there. I'll tell you, the, the Institute was started in 1981 in, at uh, the Kelly Shipyard at the time. Um, and it was established to teach merchant mariners how to study for their exams uh, to increase their licensure. Um, we, my, my wife Angela and I, we purchased it in 1995 uh, after I went to sea for a number of years on LNG tankers and actually managed two LNG tankers out of Lake Charles, Louisiana in New Orleans. Uh, it was time to move home to have children and uh, we heard about this opportunity of Northeast Maritime uh, being for sale. We bought it and immediately uh, turned it into a training institution, more like the experience I would have had in the Coast Guard receiving training to upgrade my credentials. As a result of that decision, we became overnight, uh, actually around by 1997, the largest privately held maritime training facility in the United States. We had the old YWCA building in New Bedford, the Bourne Counting House, and I'll tell you, we were pumping out mariners. Pumping them out was a problem, quite frankly, because what happened is we had so many students, we felt like we had created a factory. Mm -hmm. we, we talked to one another and said, you know, we're, we're, we're not doing what we said we were going to do is produce quality education and training. And so we, we looked elsewhere to Fairhaven, and uh, Gail Isaacson uh, reached out to my wife and said, hey, how about you guys taking over the old boys club? It had been abandoned for six years. Um, 
it was they were ready to tear it down. And uh, uh, my wife said, oh, Eric, we'll go look at the, the structural integrity, which meant crawling on my belly and my back under underneath the crawl spaces to, to look at the beams and really <laughs> discovered that the building was structurally sound. It, it just needed some severe uh, TLC. Um, mm-hmm. So with that, we, we introduced uh, the concept into Fairhaven. And by limiting our physical space, we, it actually enabled us to manage a quality maritime education and training component where people wanted to be in school, the instructors wanted to be in school. And it, I'll tell you, it, it was the best decision of our lives um, because we became overnight um, you know, famous for the quality and the compassion of, of maritime education and training and the way we delivered it. And uh, we have people from all over the world coming for their tr- certification training, for pilot training from Brazil, from New Orleans, uh, from uh, Savannah. We just had the Savannah, president of the Savannah Pilots Association uh, up at the Institute last week. Um, and now, of course, we're excited to uh, announce that we're the first private maritime college in the history of the United States. And uh, you know, what better place than greater New Bedford, the South Coast, uh, to host this this little school that uh, we're calling it a micro college, quite frankly, because we do want to keep it small. Um, but we want serious minded mariners. And, and we're only going to run a two year degree program, never get into the four year degree program because Mass Maritime does such a great job up in, in uh, up on the canal. And, and what we want to do is augment interest in this industry, in this career path, start them out at NMI. Hopefully they'll, they'll be able to go on to other academies uh, or further their careers just by going to sea, coming to school, going to sea, coming to school. Um, but I'll tell you, it's exciting. And, and I think, and I believe in, in my heart of hearts, that the Institute will be one of the ma- major players globally uh, based on our investment in technology. You know, for example, we are creating a learning management system that will deliver maritime education and training worldwide uh, at very affordable prices for mariners who would not be able to afford to come to schools like ourselves. And, and that's probably the most proud project that I have on the table right now. And, and in the future, we'll bring in, in, in our director of that program to talk about that. And I'll tell you, I, I, I'm, I believe the world will be coming to Fairhaven and Bedford, uh, even if it's online. I do believe you. Eric DeWicki, host of Maritime Matters here on AM 1420 WBSM. And in a time and an age when the fishing industry itself is drowning, and uh, if we can use that metaphor, I see that your institute is going to play a very important, a critically important role in perhaps redirecting the future of some of these maritime workers. Absolutely. We've, we've had a history um, of taking fishermen who were just simply tired of fishing because of age, uh, wear and tear on their bodies, and we take them with all their knowledge and all their seafaring capacity and we polish them up a little bit with the Coast Guard credentialing and they end up as some of the best merchant mariners in the world. Um, the history of the New Bedford fishermen transferring into the merchant marine has been a great, great success for the tug and barge industry, the research vessel industry, the ferry industry. We have people calling every day looking for ex-fishermen to go to work for their companies. Look at that. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, this is why it not only will be an interesting show, vitally important uh, in our area, but also a show that is designed to be one of a kind, just like your institute and just like uh, the way you have always been in this area, a pace setter leading the way, kind of, uh, you know, very, very different from everyone else. Well, I think the fact that, you know, America as a whole produces so many opportunities for people. And, you know, I look at my culture and my history, and and my last name is Dewicki, pronounced Davitsky in Polish. The fact that my grandfather 
came to this country, became a seafarer. My father was a merchant marine, uh, chief engineer, uh, worked at the Steamship Authority uh, at 16 years old out of New Bedford, um, became a very famous marine engineer, uh, many books uh, written about my dad. Um, my brothers worked for Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, you know, we have to be excited and we have to set the pace for people to take into interest in this industry because I look at the food that this industry put on my family's plate. Sure. And I just, I'm stunned by the opportunities that it provides to this day. And um, I really do uh, hope that we can enable other people who, who need jobs mm -hmm. to get into such a great industry. Very, very interesting. Eric, before we uh, take a quick break, if folks listening uh, truly want uh, an opportunity in this respect, what can they do? I'll tell you, Phil, you know, if somebody is interested or somebody's interested in, in the industry for their children or their grandchildren, you know, take a quick look online. You know, Google the maritime industry, Google ships, maritime jobs. And you'll, you'll end up with an unbelievable amount of information on the industry. I think, uh, you know, Google uh, IMO.org, that's the UN's maritime branch. People don't realize the importance of that international branch that lays the foundations for a regulatory structure. You know, I look at my career and I, I, I think, geez, I started off in the Coast Guard Reserve. Ended up going off to college, came back from college, didn't know what to do, ended up as an ordinary seaman on a, on a tanker. Um, ended up going from there to AB, able-bodied seaman, bosun, third officer. Then I got called into the office to become part of the management team. While I was doing all this, I was still working with the Coast Guard, um, you know, working on policy initiatives, uh, anti-piracy initiatives for LNG tankers. I was drafting some of the regulatory requirements for that. Um, my career has taken me uh, from ships to literally uh, visiting with prime ministers and premiers of countries and ministers of transport and energy all around the world, um, working on policy initiatives and trade initiatives. The industry is so expansive, it includes banking, it includes cargo brokering, it, lawyering, uh, it, it includes... Uh, you know, the development of, of uh, contracts to trade, um, not only between companies, but nations. So the industry is so expansive. Why not? My question to the listenership is, why not the South Coast become the leader of the industry globally? That's a great question, and we'll be talking about that plus coming up. Now, what actually uh, is a merchant marine and uh, what uh, industries actually exist? Uh, that and more when we come back with Maritime Matters with Eric DeWicke. Welcome back to Maritime Matters with Eric DeWicke. Folks, this is the debut of an exciting brand new radio show. And Eric, before we get into some of the uh, topics that we'll be talking about this segment regarding, you know, what a merchant marine is, the jobs and everything. Let's take a look once again at what the purpose, what the mission of this brand new radio show is. Thanks, Phil. The, you know, the mission really is to make sure that we as the South Coast know that we have an opportunity to participate in our historical and cultural roots of the maritime industry of yesterday and now bring that connection well into the future. I think just our, our, our basic knowledge of the maritime industry from this region enables us to do as good a job, if not better, than any, any nation organization out there to participate in this world trade. And I think it's, it's really time that we stop thinking about reinventing ourselves and remembering our roots and, and press on and move forward and, and take the lead again in this industry. Very impressive. Uh, as we move forward now, I'd uh, like to hear your thoughts about merchant marines. What, what exactly is a merchant marine? How would you describe a merchant marine to the everyday lay public? Well, I'll tell you, the merchant marine was the civilian corps, uh, was established as a civilian corps 
uh, to deliver goods, products, and munitions um, during the war time period. And, you know, I, I used to sit there and listen to my uh, grandfather, DeWicki, um, talk about his experiences. When, when he was out of the Army, he went right into the Merchant Marine to deliver goods. And um, he used to jokingly talk about the only thing they had to shoot back at the Germans with was, was bologna and salami. Um, and, uh, you know, these guys risked everything. Um, they, they had no guns to, to fight back with. They were sitting ducks in these convoys. And the Merchant Marine really, I, I would argue, they were one of the major factors in winning the war, especially World War II, um, you know, by, by being still dedicated to their country, their nation, uh, to the Allies, uh, to really uh, facilitate what we believe in here with our American values. Um, Merchant Marine has evolved uh, greatly uh, to become one of the more sophisticated industries. The, the, the shipping or the maritime industry is, is probably the highest regulated uh, industry in the world in terms of safety and security and environmental protection. And you really have to be one smart cookie to be able to work in this industry uh, and dedicated to the mission of, of plying the seas to deliver goods, um, to deliver research, uh, to, to deliver safety and security. Um, it's not always the people in, in uniforms mm -hmm. that are delivering these things. And the Merchant Marine has become a vital part of global trade not only for the United States, but so many other countries. Um, it, it's no longer a U.S.-centric industry, but uh, uh, quite honestly, uh, you know, the U.S. plays a, a major and vital role in that. I'm so thrilled to see that a radio program is going to honor uh, that very important segment of history and the Merchant Marine many times uh, overlooked. Uh, I'm glad to see that Maritime Matters is going to do just that as uh, we now look into some of you know, the issues that uh, we'll be talking about, one of which, of course, is what industries uh, actually exist. Well, I'll tell you, you know, when, we, when we look at the shipping industry, um, we first look at it from a, the very lowest or smallest vessel type. People don't realize uh, somebody taking out six passengers or more, or, or less, excuse me, uh, on a uh, little charter boat requires a license from the United States Coast Guard. They receive a merchant marine credential, uh, and they cannot take people out to go fishing for hire without the appropriate credentialing. From there, you move up into the passenger vessels, small launch tenders that bring people out to their boats, uh, deliver them shore to shore in very small areas, to ferries, to research vessels. Uh, in, in our country, the biggest part of the merchant marine is the tug and barge industry, uh, which replaced the coastal tankers and coastal freighters. Um, and I'll tell you, that is a very expansive aspect of our industry here in the United States. Right down uh, in Woods Hole, we have the, probably the most famous research uh, or, or ocean science research facility in the world in the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, um, which merchant mariners are operating their research vessels. Uh, um, I'm, I'm uniquely associated with that because my grandfather started off on the original research vessel Atlantis. My father was on the Atlantis II. My brothers were on the Atlantis II in the NOR and the Oceanic. And, um, you know, what a, what a place to go to work. Not only are you getting you, – not only do you have the capacity to play with these boats and ships, but uh, you're engaged in science and, and discovery and adventure. And, boy, you know what? I, I'm a little jealous because I didn't get to work in that industry. <laughs> but uh, I, certainly, I certainly fantasized about it. But what a tremendously important link, what a, a connection that you personally have. And I think this further enhances the uh, purpose of this radio program, what you're going to do with it, and how you're going to share very important information with our listeners. And if you're just tuning in, ladies and gentlemen, 
This is the debut of Maritime Matters with Eric Dewicki, president of the esteemed Northeast Maritime Institute, as uh, we talk about things that matter, things very important, and the types of marine jobs in this segment. And uh, let's start with how a ship operates. What are some of the basics here? Well, I think when we talk about a ship, um, just the basic operations of the ship, uh, we require a crew. The crew is made up of uh, unlicensed personnel. These are deckhands, uh, as well as uh, members of the engine department to uh, assist the officers to functionally operate these this equipment. At the end of the day, a ship is a very large piece of equipment. So in order to do that safely and efficiently, um, we have to establish some standards of training and certification. Um, the, the remarkable uh, aspect of that is there's so many procedures in operating a ship because, uh, of course, what are, what are some of our greatest memories about the, the shipping industry? It's tankers hitting reefs, um, tankers uh, spilling oil. Um, we don't see much of that anymore. It's very, very rare. And, that, and the reason is it's because we truly – are, are facilitating legislation, regulations, and, and international standards to prevent any of those events from happening. So when you do that, the requirements of knowledge and proficiency that have to occur are extremely significant. So these folks from, from ordinary seamen on up to master or captain of a vessel have to have incredible amounts of education and training. Are uh, there candidates in this area available for everything from the deck to what you were just referring to because of their linkage, of uh, their experience on the uh, open waters? Absolutely. Um, We can actually take somebody that has never been to sea and and start them on a career path uh, from ordinary seaman to captain. However, luckily... Uh, in the South Coast area, we have great exposure to the maritime industry and our fishing industry. Uh, many of uh, the merchant marine uh, in the 60s and 70s actually hailed from New Bedford and Fairhaven and the South Coast in general. Um, I went to sea with folks that my grandfather went to sea from, uh, uh, anywhere from Providence to Boston, um, and it was really unique to understand what a connection that our region has with the sea because I, I even met a guy in Singapore um, that literally was from uh, Mattapoisett uh, that was stopped in Singapore on a ship. So just a, an amazing thing that, that happens with our industry. And, and what we seem to have done is lost a little bit of that connection over the last 20 years. I think from a personal perspective, my passion and my experience has been so driven by just a wonderful uh, amount of opportunities in my lifetime, in my family's lifetime, that we need to impart that story to, to develop opportunities for other families, for other people looking for work. And, and again, I believe New Bedford, the South Coast, produces some of the best seafarers in the world. And uh, I guess the bottom line here, Eric, is that employment is a real thing when it comes to, you know, finding out uh, whether it's the deck or how a ship operates and everything in between. Employment is a very important part of this that you're going to be a part of. And that, I believe, is just a great economic generator in this area. Well, the nice part about going to sea is you can live at home. You either meet the vessel uh, via plane, train, or automobile. Um, you're, you're paid to travel uh, to meet the ship. Um, the, 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 the great uh, aspect of this is the median income for the person starting out in this industry is $49,000 a year. Wow. working six to eight months a year. That's not too shabby in my no, opinion. No, it's not. Not too shabby at all. And how high can uh, the salaries go? Give us a range. 49000 is a wonderful 
you know, basic uh, startup level, but how high can the uh, salaries go? Well, for example, the average salary of a master of a tug and barge unit delivering oil up and down the coasts is $175,000 a year, again, working six to eight months a year. Um, but there are some salaries in the offshore industry and in the drilling industry down in the Gulf Coast that are upwards of $325,000 a year. And that comes with a special uh, specialized training certificate called uh, dynamic positioning, which uh, I'm excited to say we're, we're looking into putting uh, a simulator in, in, at the Institute for dynamic positioning to get our local mariners that certification to have those opportunities to go to work in that industry and, quite frankly, bring that money back home to the South Coast, spend it here, enliven our, our region, invest in our region, and, and like so many people did before us, and including hundreds of years ago. Let's take that maritime money, re, reroute our community with it. The uh, institute that Eric DeWicke is referring to, ladies and gentlemen, is the Northeast Maritime Institute. We're with Eric DeWicke, host of a brand new interesting radio show called Maritime Matters. And we'll be talking about a lot of the matters of, the, of this industry. And speaking of which, lots of cargo ships come into the harbor here. Give us uh, an overview of cargo shipping and how your institute, for instance, is interrelated. What uh, employment opportunities exist in the area of cargo shipping? Well, I'll tell you, we, uh, I think the first thing I want to talk about is New Bedford's potential as a major cargo hub. Uh, where we are located logistically, the fact that we, uh, our harbor is attached to a major rail link uh, the fact that we are attached to the I-95 corridor, um, we could be one of the major um, small ports um, in the United States because of this multimodalism that exists that we haven't quite frankly used in the last 30 years. Um, I'm excited to see progress has been made. The dredging is, a, is very important. Well, it may have been controversial to a few, the fact is it's going to create industry and trade and job potential. Um, we need that here. You know, let's, let's face the fact, folks. You know, the, the southeastern Massachusetts, Fall River, New Bedford uh, area has an extremely low unemployment rate, or high, excuse me, unemployment rate. Uh, and we really do need to improve that. And, and why not get right back to our roots in, in working our maritime opportunities and developing our maritime opportunities we not only have to do that as individuals, but we need to do this as a public. Um, we need to do this as a community, as a whole. Um, we need the state to back us. We, we need our cities to start to talk to one another. We need our politicians to start to think progressively and not, you know, chase themselves to, you know, to try and figure out how to put out the fires that have been created. We need to start building. And I think the easiest way to build is building on our history and our culture in, in the maritime sector. I noticed that uh, something that has not been utilized is uh, a tax-free incentive. We have that zone in this area. It's hardly been tapped into. Uh, I wonder if that will come into play in terms of you know getting tax credits, tax incentives to do things here in this area, and then perhaps, you know, shipping that product on to another country. I'll, I'll tell you, economic free zones are very famous worldwide. Yes. Um, the most successful maritime nations of today are nations you would not think about. Um, Bermuda, Singapore, uh, Bahamas. These are all maritime tax free, free zones. And what they've done is very, they've created a very progressive system to enable companies to participate in the industry in a very, uh, in a much more creative way than the standardized tax system that exists typically in the United States. Ironically, the United Kingdom is the nation that pushes this concept the hardest. And the United Kingdom manages all of the maritime trade. It all goes through London. 
insurance, cargo brokerage, all goes through London while they're using other nations to facilitate this trade. It's a brilliant strategy. I'd like to figure out how we can do it here as the United States, but make make uh, the, the, the South Coast the uh, primary facilitator of those mm-hmm. concepts. Eric, if anyone can do it, it's you, especially during this season of independence when we broke away from, from the England uh, because of of the taxation, it's very interesting. It's an ironic twist that you bring this up uh, here on this brand new radio show. Tell us also uh, about uh, some of the uh, industries that are intimate in this area with the maritime industries that uh, you personally know that uh, you can create some kind of revenue generation from. I'll tell you the the ports in New Bedford. Uh, really do provide a great opportunity, not only for uh, jobs on vessels, but people uh, managing logistics. Like what? Um, managing cargo transfer, dock workers. Mm-hmm. Um, dock workers, people might think that's a low-paying job. They make $22 an hour starting out. And what do, the, what do they do? They unload and load cargo. Very simple. They become it's 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 not as simple as doing it physically, but driving cranes and running cranes. And I'll tell you, you have to have a, a solid uh, industrial acumen to do that. So that's why they're pretty highly paying jobs. And this kind of background is exactly uh, why uh, it's very important that we talk about these issues, and we can find out more about why maritime matters when we continue on the debut of this great new radio program here on the new 1420 WBSM Maritime Matters with Eric DeWicke. Welcome back to Maritime Matters with Eric DeWicke. This is the debut of a new radio show, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to talk about the history, the, the culture, and the industry today and tomorrow linked to the South Coast. And Eric, nobody better to host this program than you. Uh, During the last segment, we talked uh, briefly about longshoremen and are there jobs that do not need training or put otherwise, do all the jobs in the industry need some kind of training? And if yes, where do they get this kind of training? Well, typically, Phil, uh, the jobs that require training are the shipboard jobs. However, with the longshoremen, um, there are crane operators, um, heavy equipment operators. So for ships, you would go to schools like Northeast Maritime Institute, Mass Maritime Academy, other smaller schools that have that maritime education and training component. For the longshoremen, you can go to truck driving schools, um, get your certification, get OSHA certification, uh, and really... Uh, that opens up the doors for these jobs that are actually going to be increasing uh, in New Bedford Harbor over the next few years, I assume. Uh, every, every indication suggests such. Um, so I think what we need to think about is what job opportunities exist, how do we prepare ourselves for those opportunities to make sure that, that people from the region, from the South Coast region, actually obtain those opportunities. Yeah, let's let's talk about that and bring it uh, to the next level. Do you retrain uh, workers who have been doing one thing and uh, hopefully train them for something else that's coming up in the future? We certainly do at Northeast Maritime Institute. We've been working with uh, workforce development quite a bit. Uh, We work with people anywhere from former fishermen to people with no experience in the maritime industry but have some type of industrial experience that they might want to transfer into the maritime sector. And and the transition is is extremely well guided. We are uh, licensed by the uh, State Department of Higher Education as well as their Division of Licensure um, for our our certification programs. We we are very well regulated to make sure that if, if we produce these educational components, there's jobs at the end of them. And that's that's not only critical for the state, quite frankly, that's more critical for me 
Uh, I'm a firm believer in education that nobody should collect tuition unless there's a job at the end of it. Uh, uh, I could get into a whole show about that, but uh, <laughs> you know, the reality is we need to actually produce education and training that will result in putting food on tables. We will definitely look forward to the show that is dedicated to that theme. But just for a moment, Eric, let's just take one example, an anecdotal example of somebody that has done just that, has been retrained and is now gainfully employed, somebody perhaps locally. Well, I, you know, I can name probably 100 names. We, I think one of my favorite stories is, is a friend of mine who I grew up with at Fairhaven High School uh, was a fisherman. And um, the fishing industry started to collapse greatly in the 90s. Um, he took that knowledge, came to the Institute, applied that knowledge, used his sea time that he acquired in the fishing industry to receive merchant marine credentialing. He is now a captain uh trading oil uh, up and down the Gulf Coast, making one heck of a living, um, and, and is extremely successful. And uh, this is a guy that uh, will not only be producing for his family, but will have been able to put enough away to assist his grandchildren and maybe even their grandchildren. So I, I think these are the stories that uh, are typical from what we are realizing at the Institute but every once in a while, somebody will knock on the door. Hey, I, 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 my grandfather went to sea or my father went to sea and I need a job, you know. Yeah. So come on in. Let's sit down. We, we, we really do brief them about what the industry is all about, some of the pitfalls of the industry. You are away from home sometimes. Um, and we really make sure that when we basically intake them, we assign them right to student services who really builds up their, their, the procedures of how they're going to start, how they're going to receive education and training, but most importantly, how they're going to receive a job. Our student services component, you know, we, we literally teach them how to write their resumes in the way, shape, and form that the uh, industries and the companies want them to produce their resumes. Um, and then we, every week, we have a job board at the Institute. We put brand new jobs up every single week. And I believe that's about 20 jobs a week that are posted uh, on our job board. And, and Phil, I think that in itself should resonate with our community. There is work, there's employment, and well-paying employment. Eric, uh, many times... We have heard of young people graduating from four-year institutes, and they can't find work. Uh, it's just the reality of after spending a lot of money on an education, uh, facing a future that is, you know, a question mark. And yet here, I'm so glad to, to have you bring these issues forward that there are jobs. They're plentiful and there's plenty of retraining. There's plenty of opportunities here that we'll be talking about in weeks to come. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we, uh, we try to focus on the jobs, of course. But sometimes getting the appropriate training, the funding for the training, sometimes the state can't facilitate that funding. Um, the Institute actually created a, a concept called MET Co-op, the Marine Education and Training Cooperative. And it's a membership program that is a tuition discount program. And it's anywhere from, it depends on the time uh, of our economic phases. It's 20% it's off of tuition now. It's been as high as 50% off of tuition for the Institute to provide their own grants to our students to make sure they did have access to employment. The Institute has really uh, been more of an altruistic organization than anything, I think. It's, it's uh, something I, I know I'm the most proud of uh, for our maritime community here um, because it, it does put so many people back to work and puts food back on the table of so many locals. And 
quite honestly, people who have been down and out from other parts of the country. They've, they've literally found themselves in New Bedford, found the opportunity, and we polish them up, get them an education, get them certified, and we find them jobs. Uh, and this is literally off the street. What about basic safety training? Do you offer that? Uh, tell us a little bit about this issue. In order to start any job on a ship, uh, 500 gross tons or more, it is required that uh, every employee of that ship have basic safety training. Mm -hmm. And the basic safety training is that introductory training of what the maritime industry is all about. And in order to weed out the seriousness of the industry or the people who are serious about going into the industry, they're exposed to this basic safety training program, almost like boot camp, right? <laughs> but in a much more relaxed environment, of yes. course. Um, basic safety training, first and foremost, is you're, you're on a confined community, so you have to be able to take care of certain things uh, if something goes wrong. You, you simply can't call 911 when you're on a ship. So basic safety training, the first class is first aid and CPR. Everybody on a ship must know first aid and CPR. Uh, the second class is called personal safety and social responsibilities. How are we going to act and treat one another in this confined environment? Um, the third class is proficiency. I'm sorry, it's uh, personal survival techniques, um, which is uh, how do you survive at sea if, yeah. if your vessel sinks, mm. uh, if you fall overboard, uh, if somebody else falls overboard. Uh, it's a very intense class where we uh, – have a day of theory. We talk about all these events, and then we have about a half a day in in, in a deep water pool. We use the uh, Wareham YMCA pool, and we we you know get these future mariners in survival suits and personal flotation devices. We pop life rafts in these pool. We create agitated water environments where they have to learn how to survive and relax at sea. Uh, and, and figure, figure out every possible technique that we know of, preventing hypothermia, preventing drowning, and saving others. Uh, and, and that one is, is a passion course for me because uh, I started my career in the Coast Guard uh, Reserve, and, and these were events that used to rattle my cage when somebody had to be saved. And so that class is one that I really put a lot of emphasis in. And then the last class in the basic safety training program is uh, basic marine firefighting. You get a fire on a ship, where are you going to go? Right. So <laughs> you, you, you literally have to go out and put that fire out on your own. Well, imagine putting out an oil fire in an engine room, uh, which I had to do once. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, I, I, these were the days when basic safety training was not included. I put a fire out in plastic flip-flops, shorts, uh, in a T-shirt. Well, gosh, that was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> um, the reality was it was dumb, you know, and, and thank God I was 19 and nimble and was able to get out of the trouble. I, I can't say I was 19. I think I was 23, actually, for that. And, uh, you know, the reality is new standards of introducing people into this environment safely, efficiently, and cost-effectively is really critical. And, you know, again, uh, the, the nice part is we, as a maritime community, as a maritime hub, have opportunities for employment. Before we say thank you to our listening audience for tuning in to this brand new radio show we know you'll enjoy in the future called Maritime Matters with Eric DeWicke, tell us what you hope to accomplish with this radio program. Phil, it's, it's, it's a personal goal of mine to allow people to understand that there is employment, there is opportunity, there is economic development, there is an opportunity for our community to become a world leader in the maritime sector as a whole, not just shipping, information management systems, brokering, admiralty law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think New Bedford, Fairhaven, is poised to do that. I think you're so right. And folks, we know that you'll enjoy future broadcasts of Maritime Matters with Eric Dwicky 
a personal pleasure to be with you on the launch of your debut, Eric, and we look forward to our next broadcast. Thank you so much, Phil. 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 So much, Phil.